Hi, fellow ruminators. Welcome back to another session, Rumination with Andrew. Thank you so much for joining as we are about to discuss a very important topical matter. And today we are going to talk about Dr. Omar Davis, the IMF, um, so-called archival information, um, which I deem to be report. I, I call it the unfinished report because everything in Jamaica is unfinished. Jamaica is an unfinished experiment. And I don't think that we are committed, the leaders that is, not I, but the leaders are not committed to finishing any work that they have begun. And hence the dilemma, the, dilemma, the conundrum that we call Jamaica, that it is filled with a lot of contradictions because our leaders, our political and financial leaders are not devoted to constructing, to building a society that works for most Jamaicans, if not all Jamaicans, because society will never work for everyone, but it will work for the majority of people. We say that we are a democracy, but democracy means the majority. And in Jamaica, the economy and the country at large has always worked for the minority, for the oligarchy, not for the majority. Hence, I think we have a four democracy. It is not a true democracy as we have uh, pretended to be. And, you know, we it would have been a democracy if at least we were making some of our pretend pretensions reality, right? But we are not even trying to pretend here. I think that we have given up on even pretending, the leaders at, at least. They have not been doing the job that they are assigned to do. In fact, they are exploiting, and right now they are brazenly, brazenly in looking into your face. So they are audaciously looking into your face and say that, what can you do? What can you do? We are the leaders and we do um, whatever we so desire. That is the reality of modern Jamaica, and there's nothing that you can do that I can do to stop them. We only can alert people to understand that voting, just voting and casting your vote is not sufficient. Yes, it's a part of the democratic rights and processes. However, that is not going to, it doesn't stop there. You've got to inform yourselves. You've got to understand what is happening in the country at large. And, you know, we look, we opened up yesterday with a story coming out of Jamaica that says that, Crime is one of the major, if not the major concern of Jamaicans. You know, um, I have it here on my phone. I can't pull it up on my computer. So I'm going to have to read it on my phone. Some aspects, you know, of the excerpts from that article. So we have crime remains stock concern despite declining stats. And this is what we like to say. We like to say everything is declining. Poverty has declined. You know, unemployment rate has declined. Everything is always trending in the right direction, yet the citizens are not perceiving it that way, right? What the, the ministers are saying, the leaders are saying, the people are that is not in sync, does not align with what the people are thinking and the reality that they are living. Not only what they're thinking, but the reality um, that they are surrounded by. So we have, despite year on year on, declines in all major categories across the island, crime and violence continue to be the foremost concern for Jamaicans. So according to them, crime and violence is actually reducing. But look at what they're saying. Now look at the stats that they're using. Up to October 12th, police statistics showed that murders have fallen by 19.2% since January when compared to the corresponding period in 2023. Over the same period, shootings have also fallen by 6.6%, rape by 29.7%, robberies by 187 and break-in by 2.1%. So this is what they're saying, that these negligible decline should result in Jamaicans being happy with the fact that crime and violence in Jamaica have declined, right, have been reduced. But is that truthful? Is that what they're telling us truthful? And this is what we have to look at because a lot of times our politicians are not telling us the truth. They are not telling us the truth. And that is what we need to say here. That is what we need to intimate. We need to advance 
on this podcast, that our politicians are not truthful people. So this is what Jamaicans are saying. And the writer of the article went on to interviewing some people. So here's what the, uh, the writer says. Despite the official reports that there has been a reduction in crime and violence across Jamaica, there is still the perception among a significant number of persons that crime and violence is the biggest problem facing Jamaica today, said MRSL CEO Anderson in his summation of the results. Right? So people are thinking and the government need to listen to the people and stop compiling subjective statistics that are not really speaking the truth. Now, Dr. Christopher Charles, now he is a professor of political and social psychology at the University of the West Indies and Mona Campus, is not surprised by the findings. Now, this is what um, Charles, Professor Charles uh, is saying. The very high um, homicide rate over many decades, in ignoring domestic violence in dysfunctional homes that are the incubators for the killers, the absence of customer service and efficiency in the country, the press conference journalism phenomenon, right? So we have this press conference journalist phenomenon, which journalists do not get anything because they are run by corporations in which many journalists, this is what Charles is saying now, not me, in which many journalists seem unwilling to ask searching questions of powerful people, right? They are unwilling to ask searching questions of powerful people. What have I been, what have I been saying on this program? I have been saying that since I started this podcast, that Jamaicans have a profound aversion to truth. And we are not courageous people as we think we are. We do not want to rock the boat. We do not want to challenge powerful people because we know that that will be the death of our careers and our self-importance. So we continue to play the games with them as much as we like to think of ourselves that we are this country that is so small yet has had global impact on the world stage, right? That is what we have to understand. The substandard high school graduates flooding our universities and our inability to solve problems at the personal, organizational, community, and national levels. What is the purpose of an education? To solve problems. If you do not know how to solve problems, if we're not talking about our, our problems, if we're not debating our problems, we are not educated. Right, We might be degreed, we might be credentialed, but we are not educated in the right sense of the word, in the true sense of the word. Charles expressed his deep concern about the poor quality of customer service at all societal levels and the alarming deficit, even at the University of the West Indies. He's talking about the general society, but I think he's referring to all societal levels, including the University of the West Indies, which has very poor customer service, extremely poor customer service. And you just want to deal with them. They don't even know how to communicate in terms of responding to a, an email that you send them. And they're not efficient. They are inefficient. Yet these are the people who are training young minds to be productive citizens of the society when they can't even answer an email promptly. They can't give you an answer to a simple email. Probably takes them years, if not, you know, decades to respond, if they ever respond. Because they think, again, that they are important. Listen to what Charles is saying. And I quote, I'm quoting here from Professor Charles. We are unable to solve our problems in the country we confuse degree holders with problem solvers. So people have all these PhD, up to PhDs and they're doctor and they have nothing in the brain, right? Nothing in the brain with all these advanced degrees. They don't read, right? They have just read the little that they were exposed to in, at university and they think, and the university degrees are brainwashing degrees anyway, right? They're not supposed to empower. They'll just allow you to work in the factory and become a factory worker wherever you're working. So there is low quality of public discussion and low levels of integrity and rampant corruption in the country, right? He lamented. Now, as he speaks about corruption, and, and we have spoken about corruption ad nauseum on this podcast, there was a, an art, article rather written by uh, Ian Boyne. Let me see if I can pull it up. 
yeah, here, hopefully it will come up, yes. And in which he says, beware of voodoo economics. We shall talk a little about it, about this article, but let's look at what Ian Boyne says in his last paragraph. And this article was published on Sunday, November 29th, 2009, when they you know, were opening. That was the launch of the FinSAC inquiry, right? And he says this, this is what Ian Boyne is saying. This is why the debate is necessary. He's talking about debating where we are going as a people, right? Not for the parties to grandstand, but for the public to be educated about supposed alternatives and painless paths. Because he was saying we need to have a debate about low interest rates, which we had during the FinSAC era, versus high interest rates, and how these things might disturb might enhance or might demolish your economy, right? The impact of the economic impacts of that sort of economic policy of high interest rate versus low interest rate. So he was suggesting that we need to have an open and transparent debate. But look at what Ian Boyne is saying, which I find to be profound. And have been, I have been saying this since I started the podcast too. I've been saying this. I've been telling you that. Right. One of the greatest. That, OK, let me share it. Let me share it with you, because I think you are going to say I'm lying on the dead man. Right. And I don't want to tell, you know, false tales on a dead man. Right. I don't want to do that. I don't want to project that sort of, you know, image. <laughs> so I like to show my receipts and let me show my receipt here that you can see. Let me see if I could make this large, the screen larger. So. One of the greatest forms, this is what Ian Boyne is saying, of corruption in Jamaica is intellectual corruption. Could I repeat that? One of the greatest forms of corruption in Jamaica is intellectual corruption. People fear to speak the truth because they fear being penalized for their opinions or because they want to curry favor with the rich and powerful. These are not my words, ladies and gentlemen. People fear to speak the truth because they fear being penalized by their for their opinions, rather, or because they want to curry favor with the rich and powerful. But we must debate these issues, for we have already seen the incalculable damage that economic misadventures can bring, right? And we are having, we're on that path, they're still exploring and, you know, we're on the road of misadventures. <laughs> we like to experiment with things that we know do not work. But because we're so proud and because we're so brilliant and we think we're so intellectual, we end up on the wrong road, treading on the wrong path to our destruction, to self-destruction as it were. The fact of the matter, however, is that the people who are destroyed evidently are not the minority class. Are probably a few, you know, will be destroyed, but for the most part, the large majority of them find havens. They, they find a safer path um, to a prosperous road. You know, they might jump ship before the entire ship hits the iceberg. And that's what is happening. But the majority of Jamaica, Jamaicans will sink, even among the middle and the working classes. We tend also to put ourselves into classes, not on the that we're all connected. We're all connected. And if we don't stand up for the rights of the man at the lower level, then we are also going to be impacted. Because all of these economic policies that have been implemented will affect everyone, particularly those of the working and middle classes. But people who are the, the minute middle class in Jamaica think that they're so privileged and they side with the upper elites. And then when the ship now begin to sink, the members of the upper class, they find the members of the middle class to be contemptible, right? They do not see you being equivalent to them and they forsake you and they jump ship and they're taken outside of the rot 
called Jamaica. So that's what all that's what always happens. But let us look at Dr. Omar Davis. Dr. Omar Davis is an interesting character. And I really wonder if I have all the things that I should have had here. <laughs> I don't think so. But Omar Davis, um, I just wanted to read to you something. I think I could put it up here. I wonder if I have it about your guy, Dr. Omar Davis. Now, Dr. Omar Davis is an interesting character. And we have been we have been hearing about the Pinsac and the fact that he has he was um Minister of Finance from 1993, December 20th, I understand, until a very long time, right? Um, until maybe I think he was in the opposition party until the, you know, I would think 2000, maybe 14 thereabout. I don't know. I think that, but he was there for a long, long time, right? For more than a decade, I think that he was. At the same time, well, not Minister of Finance, but he was also in opposition. So, but he was in the PNP um, and became Minister of Finance sometimes in 1993. Remember now that um, Golding came to power in 2007, so he would have been at the helm of the economy for more than 13 years in that in that case, and in which the economy of Jamaica really tankered and did not do very well. Right. So we have to understand that Dr. Omar Davis is by no stretch of the imagination a person that is seeking the development or was seeking, I should say, because he's no longer in power. He's now a retired politician. But something I came up on and um, in my research yesterday about Dr. Omar Davis, which I did not know, um, is that he actually was a, an assistant professor at Stanford University. Sometimes I think between 73 to 76, I, I understand, or it could be 76 to 79. It was 70, I think it was 73 to 76, 1976, 1973 to 1976, that he was an assistant professor at Stanford University. So he's actually a very, you know, he is accustomed to being around those elite circles and the members of the elites of the world. And one of his friends, I can't remember his name, said that Dr. Omar Davis is more respected on the global stage than he's respected in Jamaica <laughs> because he rubs shoulders with elites of the world, which also, or who also, I should not say, who also do not find Jamaicans to be on equal, um, you know, footing with them. In fact, they will think Jamaicans by in, in the majority are inferior people. One of the things that um you know that really you know astounds me, I should say, is the fact that you know when you're when you go to university, you hear these black people and these you know so-called African conscious people, they talk about slavery and they talk about the whole matter of colonialism and imperialism. That is really what they utter every day. Every day, that is what comes from their mouth ad nauseum. And they're not really putting everything in context. But what they fail to look at is or are the economics. They do not tie imperialism and most of them, I'm not saying all of them, most of them do not tie the imperial trappings of the economic policies that we often implement in Jamaica. They will not tell you that. They will not talk you know, about the IMF and how the IMF is an imperial institution. People like the Miyamotris of the world, who you think also is trying to defend the global South. And she's this wonderful prime minister of Barbados. And not understanding that she was, I don't, I don't know, she still sits on the board of the IMF, but she is an IMF enthusiast. Right? She believes in the IMF, even though it is an imperial institution that is devastating or which has devastated lots of countries around the world. But yet still she goes around and she pretends to be someone who is giving it to the global elites, right? And to the global oligarchs. And she is this, you know, powerful woman. <laughs> Not understanding that Mia Motley is just doing the bidding of the powerful elites. And she herself is a slave, right? She's just doing the bidding of powerful elites because she wants to feel that she's important. And she wants to be, finally, she wants perhaps to become 
Secretary General of the United Nations. And the United Nations, if you know, is not an impressive institution if we should read the history of the United Nations. But because you just sit down and you listen to CNN and you listen to the MSNBCs of the world, you really don't understand how these institutions work. So I can't help you if you do not want to empower yourself, if you do not want to become engaged. And many of you are not engaged because you love the lies that you are being told, even in academia. You embrace them as views and that these views are empowering you when they're not. They are disempowering. This is what you've got to understand. And as Ian Boyne says, I think one of the greatest manifestations of corruption in Jamaica is intellectual corruption, where people do not want to tell the truth because they want to curry favor with the rich and the powerful. If you forget anything that I have said in this podcast, please remember that expression from Ian Boyne. Right? Something you need to think about. And that is true. Nobody wants to speak truth to power because they know that they will be destroyed. Now, we talk about FinSAC and that there is, an, you know, the archival, whatever you want to call it, information that the Minister of Finance, uh, Dr. Clark, has, you know, um, publicized on, on the Ministry of Finance website. Now, Mark Wignall wrote an, uh, a very interesting article sometimes in December 13, 2009, also at the launch of the FinSAC inquiry. And I think this might be the best article so far that has been written very reflective about what happened in the decade of the 1990s, about the whole FinSAC debacle. Now, Wignall's world, that was what his um, writings, his column was title, right? The Wignalls, the Wignalls World. About a year after P.J. Patterson had boasted to thousands of chairing PNP supporters in 1995 that he was bidding goodbye to the IMF, goodbye, ta-ta, au revoir. He had said then his much vaunted finance minister, Dr. Omar Davies, began to demonstrate to the country just how much he says, or he was, a square-pegged public servant trying to operate in a round hole economy, right? So remember this guy's coming from Sanford University a very renowned institution. And anything with that title of Harvard and Stanford, we defy them. So if Professor or, you know, Orlando Patterson speaks something, even when he's talking nonsense, you're going to glorify him because he is affiliated with Harvard University. And because you lack the ability to think, you think that anything that comes out of Orlando's Patterson's, Orlando Patterson's mouth is gospel. It's gospel truth. Even when Patterson is also closely aligned with these neoliberal institutions like the IMF and the World Bank. And he does not critique them. Orlando Patterson does not critique in an objective way these neoliberal institutions because he knows that his career would be demolished, would be destroyed if he should ever even do that. He's not allowed to do that. And he knows that. He's not that stupid not to know that. So because... This guy here, Omar Davis, also went to Northwestern University, his, his university degree at Northwestern University in the United States. That's where he, he completed his PhD. And I've always thought for some reason that he did his PhD, pursued PhD at Cornell. So I'm wondering if he did his master's there. I don't know, but I, I always had the impression that he has some relation, uh, Dr. Dr. Omar Davis, you know, did a small stint did study at Cornell University, but that was not. You know, who studied at Cornell University? I think it was Dr. Packer. Yeah, Dr. Packer, the mathematician, the famous Jamaican mathematician and who was principal at Michael Teachers College. Yes, he was a graduate of Cornell University. So I think I was sort of, yeah, yeah, I think I was that confused thing, right? With Dr. Packer, Dr. Claude Packer. And... Uh, um, he did do his PhD. So yes, I think Dr. Omar Davis did his PhD in truth in um, at the University of North, Northwest at Northwestern rather University. Now, evidence coming out of I continue with the article. Evidence coming out of FinSAC. This is an article written by Mark Widnow. 
Evidence coming out of the FENSAC inquiry indicates that at the very least during the meltdown of the financial sector, which began in 1996, Dr. Omar Davies was in charge of something that he knew very little about, right? And that is what people confuse academia with real world, with the real world. And if you should ask me, I would any day give Manaya, that is um, doctor, that is doctor, he's not a doctor, but um, uh, what's his name again? Um, Manayar, what, what do we call him again? Manayar, what is he called? What is, I know I'm calling him by his nickname. I can't remember his name at this point in time, but you know I'm talking, Manayar, <laughs> right? I would rather, I respected him more of a finance minister than I respected Dr. Omar Davis. Even though Dr. Omar Davis went to elite institutions and taught at elite universities, because oftentimes the theory or the theories that they've studied in college do not align with the reality of life. Academia is just like a religious center where you go and you talk about these abstract theoretical frameworks that have nothing to do with anything. Have nothing, most of the times they have nothing, they're vacuous. But people who are in that sort of world, which I was a part of too, and I know how vain they are, and many of them do not have the requisite skills and knowledge to run a successful economy. Okay? Now, always giving the impression then that he was the smartest guy on the block. Of course, because he taught at Stanford University. So why would Dr. Omar Davis not be the smartest man on the block? Because if you, if any Jamaican goes to any of these elite institutions, they are the best. <laughs> they are the best. They are supposed to be the best. Right? And I'm sure that at the University of the West Indies and all these universities, you know, there, if somebody comes from these so-called North American universities, even though a lot of times they don't, have an, you know, a knowledge of what is going on, you've got to praise them because you don't understand the North American system and you are not a critical thinker, right? So he might be book smart. Let's not, let's give him his credit. He might be able to, you know, memorize and to just dish out what his professors told him. And he got his degree with, with honors and distinction. But it does mean, therefore, that he is any great mind and any great thinker, right? The two are not synonymous. Okay, so we have, uh, he, he thought he was the smartest guy on the block. That is what Wigdon is saying. He has, while giving evidence at the inquiry, pleaded in at least one instance naivete, right? Which he is. The convenience of that plea rings quite hollow after the renation of people's lives. As more is revealed, one gets the impression that P.J. Patterson had given him free reign to run like a blind bolted bull through a china shop. What a way to express it. And that's exactly what he did. Recently, I was having a conversation with one of my friends in which I said, I think P.J. Patterson did not have a guiding economic philosophy to run and to lead the Jamaican economy to prosperity. What did he believe in? What did P.J. Patterson really believe in? He was a skillful politician, let's give him his credit, right? Very deft at political maneuverings right? and winning elections. That you have to give him the credit you know, for, but being a successful politician does not equate to being a good leader. These are two distinct things, just like we're saying, being an academic does not mean that you are qualified to govern and rule a country, a nation. The two are not synonymous. You might, but you might also not be able to do that because many people are not able to think outside of the box. Many academics are unable to think outside of the box. They are just narrowed into that, you know, um, university space, the ivory tower that we call the ivory tower, they're not able to move outside the realm of the ivory tower thinking, which is largely not the thinking of the real world. <laughs> and I knew that. 
from I was there that the two are not synonymous. Okay? Now, he has never claimed that he was the train wreck. Let me see if I'm here. Um, I think I lost my, my um, I think I lost, uh-huh. Okay, I think that I lost my thing here. Okay, all right. In listening to evidence coming out of the inquiry, one does not want to make the early conclusion that a set of madmen were in charge of the finance ministry during the 1990s. But if this claim to not be made, we are forced to admit that maybe they were either incompetent or their objectives were quite narrow and sinister, known only to a select few huddled behind closed doors. Yeah, it's either they were crazy or their actions were sinister. Right, Their motives were not transparent. The decisions were made behind closed doors where all decisions were made to affect and to impact positively on a small minority. Right? It's the greatest transfer of wealth from the poor to the rich that ever or that has ever occurred in, the, in, in modern Jamaica. Now listen to what he, a connection has never been made between the IMF disengagement in 1995. This is important and I want you to listen to this. Let me even share this because this is very meaningful because I have been mulling these thoughts in my mind that there has to be some connection with the disassociation of the IMF, with the disengagement of the IMF, and the fact that we went into that sudden FinSAC era where the entire economy collapsed. So even though we were saying goodbye to the IMF, our economy was just about to fall. And one would have thought, I, you know, rightly so, that if the IMF is no longer being engaged, we could direct those funds to building our economy because we wouldn't have to pay down our debt and we wouldn't have to respond to all those austerity measures that the IMF normally dictates. Well, that is not so. The reality is opposite. So I'm happy here that Wiggy is thinking. And, you know, you don't get these articles from the so-called intellectuals. They don't make, they don't always make these connections, but they will, people like the Ian Boyens will call Mark Wigner the rum shop what you call it, intellectual that always listens to gossip and so on. But he is able sometimes to make the connection, which many of our academics there cannot make. Now, a connection has never been made between the IMF disengagement in 1995 and the mess which the finance ministry under Davis presided over for the years after 1996. What I do know, however, is that the price the country paid, even after many financial institutions were destroyed and thousands of lives of, the, of new entrepreneurs and many households were torn apart, has never been settled. And today, this moment, we are in fact still paying for the gross mismanagement of the PNP in the 1990s and beyond. And beyond. And, you know, Dr. Omar Davis in a report that he wrote. And I wonder if I could pull that report up here. Um, let me see if I could, I think I should have it on my phone here and read you some of the things that Omar Davis, some of his protestations about, you know, what was what, what happened during the FinSAC debacle, right? So I wonder if I could, but you know, he itemated, that's Dr. Omar Davis, that people are pretending to be victims, the ones who suffered the entrepreneurs that saw the close, the destruction of their businesses, the people who lost their homes, that they were all, they're all playing the victims. And we're not here suggesting that some, all the people there were doing, you know, engaged in transparent business and some might not have been running afoul of the law. Maybe you had a few, but you cannot say the large majority were. And let me say something here, categorical. What you think is the primacy of these elite institutions and that they're all investors and they're doing great and they're not participating in money laundering and gun running and drug activities, the trafficking of drugs and children and human beings. 
you are not living in the real world because most of them do, the CIBC. Because um, in the report that Omar Davis wrote, he was asking the question, he, or he asked the question, why is it that, that um, banks like the Jamaica National Building Society and the CIBC, and I think he said the C, is it the CNC or, or the N, I can't remember that institution, but he said these institutions, they were also functioning in the high interest rate economic ecology, right? And they never failed. So why did the others, his question was, why did the others fail? Like the Don Crawford's um, Central National Bank and the Eagle Bank and all, he said he was asking the question and that's a good question to ask. But I'm not sure we're going to get get the get the what you call it now the answer from Dr. Omar Davis. Listen to what Dr. Omar Davis is saying here in a report he wrote to the inquiry to the FinSAC inquiry committee. It is a travesty. This is now Dr. Omar Davis, the intellectual, the brightest, smartest guy in the room, is saying it is a travesty that several owners or senior managers who egregiously mismanaged the funds of investors or savers are seeking to portray themselves as victims of FinSAC. Right? So he's saying that the people who have fallen, the ones who are have been complaining, the, the FinSAC victims are not victims at all because they actually mismanaged. They are bad debtors. That's what he's suggesting. They are bad debtors, right? He says innumerable, innumerable violations were identified, some of which uh, we were advised would have led to criminal charges in jurisdictions with more rigorous financial legislation. So he's suggesting that the people who were there in that sort of economic landscape, most of them, that's what Mr. Dr. De Omar Davis is suggesting, were participating in illegal, illicit activities. And if the economy, if the economic landscape was properly regulated, that in some jurisdictions, maybe in some countries that are more lawful and had a much more, you know, legal and um, and had more stringent rules that govern economic activities, that they would have been imprisoned. <laughs> Violations, according to Dr. Omar Davis, included the ever greeting of loans and the making of excessive under collateralized loans to connected parties, which the banks, they do, the people do these things. The term evergreen describes the corruption practice whereby a bad loan in a group company is sold to another at face value thus removing it from portfolio of the first company, which during the economic collapse um, of the nine, of nine, of uh, 2008, a lot of the banks were alleged to have done. Right? They were alleged to have done and were alleged, had been alleged of participating in these criminal activities and nothing really for the most part happened to them. Dr. Omar Davis went on to say the corruption of animal practices discovered in these institutions bordered on the incredible, <laughs> the, the, the incredible, perhaps what the Don Crawford Century National Bank did. In the case of the Century Financial Group, headed by Mr. Don Crawford, this is what Dr. Omar Davis is saying, not my words, I'm just reading it from my phone. It was found that the external auditor was himself a bad debtor. I am not saying this. This is these are words. And if Mr. Crawford is listening, I am not saying these words, Mr. Crawford. Right? The minister is saying that. I'm sure perhaps you would have read it. It's his report. It's online. So it's accessible to anyone who wants to read it. The situation was worse within the context of the group of institutions controlled by a sect of executive chairman chairmen who call themselves the owners club. Loans to connected parties were often transferred between their institutions in order to avoid detection by the regulators. And I am not here to suggest that some of these things were not happening. I would think in Jamaica that is a lawless society. 
and the lawlessness did not just happen during the 1990s. It has been an ongoing matter. We are a lawless society, particularly post-independence, right? What I'm suggesting, and Ms. I think Mr. Crawford, Mr. Don Crawford did express it well, some of the games that he played, that's what the mainstream banks were doing. That was That's what the government was doing to that, the practices of the typical day, even though some of them were illicit. <laughs> I think Don Crawford acknowledged that, but he outgunned them at what they were doing. And because he outsmarted them, they turned on him. So if you are doing something that is not perhaps, I don't think it, I would say it's illegal, it's what the government of the day was doing or permitted. But when you begin now to outplay them at their own game, then they turn on you. And this is what happens to people like the Diddis. They, you know, and all, and I'm not here supporting Diddy. I don't even like Diddy's songs, right? And Diddy, Diddy, the, I don't like Diddy the entertainer. You know, I like perhaps, you know, I don't know Diddy in the first place. But what I'm saying here, I'm talking about Sean Combs, right? The moment you begin to get powerful, you're playing the games that they play. And lots of what Diddy is being accused of doing, there are people high up much higher than he, much more powerful than the day. They do what he does and worse. But the moment he began now acquiring a little bit more influence and power and perhaps challenging people that he should not be challenging, then they are going to put you down, right? And this is what seemed to have happened to people like the Crawfords, among other people who would have been a part of the economic ecology during the FinSAC debacle. Right. There's something that he says here that I wanted to um, highlight that Mr. Cro that that's Dr. Omar Davis said. Um, but he was intimating that the people, as I'm saying, the Jamaica National Bank and, you know, and the CIBC and all of these, you know, were a part of the same high interest rate environment. And yet still they didn't fail. Why? So he's suggesting that the reason why they did not fail because they were practicing and doing business in the legal way and not in this sort of, you know, sinister, dark um, way of doing business. This is what Omar Davis is saying here. It cannot escape notice that all the complaints being voiced at the Commission of Inquiry come from the owners, managers, and the bad debtors. So he's calling the people, the, the FinSAC victims, bad debtors. The government is not a bad debtor, but these people are. They are simply arguing that the government should have also protected them in the intervention. Listen to what Dr. Omar Davis is saying here. The cost of protecting savers or pension fund holders of insurance policies amounted to 40% of GDP. 40% of GDP. Remember now that when FinSAC happened, or before it happened, Jamaica was in the low 70s in terms of 70% of GDP. We were in the 70s, the low 70s. So let's say we were 71% of GDP. And by 2002, we were then at 102% um, of GDP. We moved from the low 70s to 102% of GDP by 2002. Right? And we have nothing to show for that. Consider what would have been the cost if bad debtors and the owners were also billed out. It would have been unjustified and irresponsible for the government to do so. Wouldn't it have been great if the government had bailed out the owners, the so-called bad debtors, because they were the ones that had jobs for people to work? And if you have a manufacturing base on which the economy can be built, then in the long term, it would have been good. In the short term, it would have had some pain. It would have been painful. Just like when you're starting a business, it's painful, you know, when you begin to make the sacrifices to invest capital into the business. But eventually, if, you know, all work well, right, then you will have a successful business in the future. All things being equal, right? So this is very important for us to grasp that Mr. That Dr. Omar Davis, Dr. Omar Davis is blaming the victims as bad creditors. 
right? Right? That's what he's doing. Listen to what he says. It's a shame that this important episode in our post independence history is being subjected to a flawed process for vulgar political objectives rather than balanced and, fa and fact finding um, and analysis. They're always the ones speaking the facts, right? The government is always the one speaking the facts. And anything that challenges the government is phony, is false, and is misinformation, disinformation, and mal information. That is what they're here suggesting. And when did we hear that during the pandemic, right? You hear you hear that anything that challenged what was coming from officialdom was not something you should listen to. You should not even engage in any sort of thinking. I don't believe that. You talk, I don't believe that, even though it's the truth. But you fail to listen because you heard it on MSNBC. This is what TVJ has said, and that settles it for me. Right? without doing any research, because you have this implicit belief in the governmental system, in the operations of government. Now, we are not here suggesting that we should disrespect your government. You should respect your government, right? It's a biblical injunction to respect and to show honor to whom honor is due. However, you've got to challenge the truth when something on truth is being spoken, whether it's your mother speaking it, your father speaking it, your government speaking, your pastor speaking it, you have to respectfully challenge the government or any, you know, um, authority members of uh, people, you know, authority figures who might be speaking on truth. You have to tell them that it's not true, right? You have to challenge them with the truth. Now, in an article that was written here by Kent Gammon, and I think Ken Gammon is a lawyer, a Jamaican lawyer, who was actually um, defending or representing the FinSAC, so-called FinSAC victims, as Dr. Omar Davis called them, the FinSAC bad debtors. <laughs> he says here, Dr. Omar Davis was introduced into the PNP cabinet in the early 1990s as a senator, come minister of finance. In this capacity, he introduced an interest rate policy that snuffed out the lives of thousands of Jamaican businesses. The average interest rate in the 1980, or 1980s rather, was approximately 20%. I want you to listen to this. I want you to listen to this. Wake up and listen to what he's saying here because he is, it, he's, you know, he's actually spilling out some very important facts. The average interest rate in the 1980s was approximately 20%. Still very high, but, you know, after Finance Minister Dr. Omar Davis assumed office, the average commercial interest rate over the period 1991 to 1997 was 51%. This, in effect, meant that businesses that borrowed at lower interest rates were now faced with higher interest rates at much higher levels than anyone could have possibly managed, imagined when they had first borrowed money, right? It's the, it's, the, it's the rapid rate at which these interest rates were going up, right? They were just going up too rapidly. There, was, there were no controls, right? Now, how could people function in such an economic environment, right? They couldn't. They couldn't. No matter how, how much integrity they had, they just could not survive in this sort of business um, economy. The decision by the PNP to liberalize the foreign exchange market in, in 1990 with insufficient net international reserves, and I remember distinctly that um, Edward Siaga, the former Prime Minister of Jamaica, did say he told Michael Manley, he warned him against liberalizing the Jamaican economy. Mr. Siago on many occasions said he warned Manley, he called him personally and told him not to liberalize the Jamaican economy and PJ and Mr. Michael Manley did not listen. Instead, it seemed that Mr. Manley contracted Peter Bunting among other people and they advised him to do so. And he did it. Michael Manley did it. The Michael Manley of the progressive era of the 1970s. 
liberalized our economy. And because of the liberalization of the economy and the policies that came along with that liberalization of the economy, which meant that you had to deregulate your economy, this is what led to the FinSAC tobacco. Right? I am sure there was some, or there might have been, you know, things that Siago, Mr. Siago did also during the 1980s that would have impacted. But I think the liberalization, that was now the death knell that led to the FinSAC debacle and hence the death of the Jamaican economy. So what we're leading, what we're seeing now is a dead economy. <laughs> it's a dead economy that is being propped up ever, ever so often. Right? That's what we're seeing there in Jamaica right now, a dead economy, because it died in the 1990s during the FinSAC debacle, and it will not be, it will never be resuscitated. So let me repeat, the decision by the PNP to liberalize the foreign exchange market in 1990 with insufficient net international reserves, the NIR, in addition to increasing the amount of money in circulation by having the Bank of Jamaica print money to satisfy government spending prior to the 1993 general elections, was a policy that put heavy demand on important goods for consumption. Right? So it is the policies, people, that led to FinSAC. It was not just some things that the businesses were doing or were not doing. The policies led by the government. People like to say, what does the government have to do with SSL? They will ask you that. The government is the one that sets laws. That's why we vote for government. So they must ensure that these businesses are working and are obedient to or following the laws of the country. And if we don't have laws, because government doesn't make laws, and hence businesses can do whatever they want to do, that is why we have SSL saga on our hands, because we are living in a lawless society. So you cannot disconnect FinSAC and, and private institutions from governmental authorities. You can't do that because the government is there to regulate the market and to craft laws that are just and fair, right? But our government just doesn't seem to have the capacity, doesn't seem to have the will or the testicular, the testicular, testi <laughs> the testicular fortitude, right? They do not have the testicular fortitude to stand up to the rich and the powerful. As Ian Bourne suggested, they know that they have to curry favor with the rich and the powerful if they want to survive in that economic ecology, in that economic environment. Right? They, do, they know that. They know that. And that's what they do. Right? That is what they do. So we have to understand that our prime minister, uh, the governments of the successive ministers and leaders of Jamaica are not particularly inclined to building, to constructing a fair and just society. Right? Yet they say they are. Right? Yet they say they are. Now, in let's go back to Ian Boyne's article entitled Beware of Voodoo Economics. Let me see if I can share my screen with you for us to look at some of the his arguments, right? In his article that was written in 2009. And you know, doing my research, I realized that we the same conversations that were had in the 1990s and the early 2000s are the same conversations we're having now and will be the same conversations we'll be having 30 years from now. Jamaica will never change because we do not want to change. Now, the pathetic picture of the 59-year-old man ambling his way on crutches to tell his tear-jerking tale of Pinsack woes 
will be etched in the minds of Jamaicans for a long time. If you ever wanted a man face to the disaster of a high interest rate policy, you got it at that FinSec inquiry. Another wretched week for Omar Davis. Now listen to what he says about this man. Michesk Willis borrowed 480,000 Jamaican dollars, but saw his high interest rate debt eventually skyrocket to 7 million, pitching him out of his house and landing him in a one bedroom house with his family of seven. Right? This is the sort of high interest rate policies. This is the devastation that it had on many people. That's the kind of human tragedy that a high interest rate policy regime can wreak. And it's why you don't have to be an economist to know that high interest rates are bad for business and human welfare. You don't have to be an economist to know that. But life is not as simple as our emotions sometimes suggest, and the temptation to believe that the low interest rate regime is a panacea to our problems should be resisted with vigor. Well, the fact of the matter is that he went on to debate, and you know, um, Yen Boyne likes to debate and to look at different views, and you don't know what is his view. But the fact of the matter is that we have to realize that the FinSAC era was an era in which people just saw these high interest rates at the spur of the moment. So they, today the interest rate might have been at four, tomorrow it went at eight. It was not something that was gradual. And they could see the gradual progress and development that they could prepare themselves for. There is no preparation, there is no predictability, no way you could predict what tomorrow would have brought you. How can you function in that environment? So it's one thing to have high interest rate, but it is there for a while. Let's say it's there for a year or two, and you can predict and make some sort of plans and adjustment to your life, to readjust your business uh, plans and strategies. But in that environment of the 1990s, during the FinSAC era, there was no way to plan. It's the same thing happening to our dollar right now. You can't plan. The, I don't see any investors going to Jamaica because you can't plan in Jamaica because the dollar is this today, tomorrow it's that. You don't have a year or so in which you can say the dollar is stable. Right? It's just chaotic because that is one of the repercussions of having an open, liberalized economy. So it's the policies. It's not that Jamaica just eventually found itself into the FinSAC debacle, right? It is because of the policies that the government implemented. Hence, the disaster. It contributed to the disaster that we faced in the 1990s, the economic disaster, which have had untold sufferings and effects. Yeah on our social existence, on our political existence as a nation, right? And our leaders are silent on the matter. Look at Bruce Golding when he was coming to power in the 2007. Look at Bruce Golding, the man of the 1990s who believed in you know, uh, constitutional reforms. And he came to office in 2007, pretending that he's a transformative, a transformational leader. And he's tight-lipped right now. He's not saying anything about the fact that the FinSAC report is unfinished. It is an unfinished document. It is a report, people. It's not just an archival document. It is a report. But it's an unfinished report. And who knows? The report might have been finished, but they've decided to hide the, what it might have been damning, and it could shake, it could rock the boat of, in Jamaica, that perhaps that would be the death of the entire country as we know it. So I don't know, maybe God is holding back the winds of strife, but what we do know is that our politicians in Jamaica cannot be trusted. Dr. Omar Davis is highly respected 
by the international economic financial you know infrastructure the economic financial institutions abroad but they are not particularly interested in Jamaicans they're not interested these international financial institutions and their managers and CEOs are not interested in the development of Jamaica Jamaicans are the ones who need to be interested in their in their own development but we are looking towards the IMF we're looking towards the World Bank we're looking towards the what the whatever bank and the financial institution to build and to counsel us and everything is that we did not heed the voice we did not take the recommendations we did not follow the recommendations of the IMF why we were why were we, why were we even consulting the IMF when we said to talk to them to tell us how to run our economy when we know that the IMF is a neo-colonial institution why were we even trying to consult them huh and because of Dr. Omar Davis is in good standing with these people huh? he is in good standing with these people and many of our elites many of our government you know our politicians rather are enriched by these corrupt activities, which are eating at the heart, at the core of the Jamaican of Jamaica's uh, Jamaican development. Eating at the core, at the heart of our national development, and hence, it seems to be that Jamaica will never be developed because our leaders are corrupt. And as Ian Boyne says, I think intellectual corruption stands at the heart of our national lack of development because our leaders fear confronting our the rich and the powerful in Jamaica. Thank you so much for joining. I hope that you like and you share and you subscribe. Remember now to like the videos so that the videos can be shared with as many people on the platform. Thank you so much. Have a great day.